Okay. Is this recording? Okay. Awesome. So um again, welcome everyone to week two of uh intro to Figma decal. Um, so this week, we're going to be building upon tools that you guys learned in the first week. So we'll be going over um, additional tools and other features of Figma and also go over critique as well as um, color theory and typography and different design fundamentals that'll help you down the line for further lectures and further assignments and projects you guys will be doing. And wait, can you guys hear me in the back? Am I good? Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, so we'll be going over, this is the agenda for today. We'll be going over some more tools. I'll go over text and color styles, type and color theory, um, how to critique, because that'll be really important. And then I think Ace will be here in time to go over the homework and labs. And then make sure to sign in to the attendance form. Um, this should be the link for that works for this um, semester and this lecture. Uh, so I'll leave this up for a second. Is everyone good on the attendance form? Yes. Awesome. Okay. And then um, this is the slide deck link. It's going to be a little different from what I'm using. I'm using the updated one, but I think Figma right now is going through some issues with like updating and publishing. So um, everything will generally stay the same. If you guys follow along, it'll just be the slide deck from the spring. Is it the spring 22 version? But everything should generally be the same. There might be a couple updates, but you should be able to follow along, which I highly recommend. Um, so yeah, I'll give a quick second to hop onto Figma and follow along. I'll be going through some live demos and such. So yeah. Okay. So more tools. Um, so I'm going to be going over some, uh, other skills and tools that you could use for collaborating and communicating, starting off with the pencil tool. Um, so the pencil tool is kind of your freehand draw tool in Figma. Uh, if you've ever used Illustrator or Photoshop, it's very similar. Um, the difference I'd say in Figma is that there's a smoothing effect when you use the pencil tool. Um, and it's located on the top um, drop down menu under the pen tool. And you could access this with the shortcut Shift P. So to show real quickly, I could you could go to this drop down right here and go to the pencil. Oh. Or you could literally just do Shift P and um, it's literally freehand. So you could see how it automatically smooths out your lines for you like this. Like, So it's really convenient. Um, the thing is, it, it's mainly used for rough sketching and note taking. I personally like did not use the pencil tool that much, but it's really nice if you're kind of rough, rough sketching ideas or want to circle things for other people to look at. Um, it's anything that's a little more informal than you would use other tools, for example. Um, and yeah. My bad, this is. And then the next tool is commenting. Um, I would say this is like one of the most fundamental tools you'll be using in Figma. Um, commenting is used to create and respond to feedback. And you could do this on files and prototypes and it helps with, uh, you could tag other people, you could reply, resolve and delete comments and you can edit them, move different comments. Um, and to use this, you it's right here all the way on the, top right hand corner of the toolbar, but the shortcut for that is also C uh, like this. So like that and uh, commenting is so essential because Figma is inherently like collaboration collaborative. Um, so you're always going to be asking other people for feedback or adjusting your own work. And it's really nice to not to have a central location where you could in real time, look at other people's comments, resolve them and such. Um, so this is a very essential feature. Um, here's a couple screenshots of what commenting looks like. Um, as you can see, you could sort by date, you could sort by unread, you could see little blobs and clusters over here of different comments. Um, and you could click on individual comments and resolve them or respond to them and such. 
And then these are additional features. It used to be called new features because I think exactly a year ago, they revamped commenting like a ton. And these are some of the things they um, added. Um, we have clicking and dragging, docking comments, and hovering and reacting. And this is a lot of text. I think I have a visual example here. Yeah. So clicking and dragging. Um, obviously, clicking is pretty intuitive. You just click and comment. Um, dragging is a newer feature where you know you have a broader frame of reference if you want to mention something that's not specific to maybe like a button or something. Uh, for example, if you want to mention like multiple frames, if you if something's wrong with the way multiple frames are arranged, you would as an example, use the comment feature. Instead of doing this, you would maybe go like, oh, these I don't see are blah, blah, blah. And then you would comment something. And then we have docking comments um, here. Um, this is another example of when the pencil tool is useful. I used it right here to draw arrows and little circles to redirect um, attention. Um, so docking comments, instead of, uh, for example, I could click this, but if I just, if I need this, um, if I need to look at a comment while also working, I could dock it right here and it'll stay there while I maybe resolve um, what Miles commented right here. And then hovering and reacting. Um, this one's pretty intuitive too, just hovering, hovering over comments, seeing what they say. And then once you click on it in depth, you could um, react to this. For example, I heart emoji this. So... That is a basic rundown of how commenting works in Figma. And I think in your future labs and assignments, you're going to be doing a lot of this, especially with your lab groups and such. Um, exporting. So obviously, once you finish, for example, like a prototype or a graphic, you're going to want to have it as a useful file to use. Um, so your designs that you make can be exported in four different mediums. So that's PNG. A JPEG, SVG, and a PDF. And there's also some customization features that aren't really necessary to learn about, in my opinion. Um, but where is it? The shortcut is Command-Shift-E. I actually don't use the shortcut. I feel like it's pretty intuitive to just, um, if I click V, uh, the export will always be the last section right here. And you can click this. And then you have your four different options. Oh, let me click on this frame. If I want to export the announcements frame as an example, I would click, okay, wait, let me move myself. Export. And then I have these four options and then you would export this. Um, so what are the file types? I think I have a slide for this as well. So like I said, a PNG, a JPEG and a SVG. Um, I have to update these graphics. I should have done that. I'm sorry. These are not the best examples because JPEGs are not usually that blurry. Um, but PNG I, and JPEG are the most popular formats to export in. They're high quality um, pixel formats. The difference is JPEG takes up way less space. Um, so in a way, PNG is a bit higher quality. And if you zoom into like a same in image in a PNG and a JPEG format, I think you'll notice a little more pixelation when you zoom in on the JPEG. But um, JPEGs generally will save you a lot more storage compared to a PNG. And then a SVG is a scalable vector graphic. Um, if you work in Illustrator, you're always working in vectors and basically there's no pixel, uh, pixelation. So, I mean, if this banana is a vector and you export this as a SVG, if you keep zooming in, you will see no pixelation. It'll just be like straight and curved lines. Um, yeah, so the vector image, image remains clean at any resolution. I will say I've never used the SVG before. Um, I feel like it's, I feel like it might be more useful if maybe, for example, if you're creating a logo for someone and you want to give them like the original like vector file, that would be useful. Um, but in general, if you're just showing people examples of different things or maybe things you've made instead of like something very formal, a PNG and a JPEG will usually get the job done. And then, yeah. So before we hop into typography, does anyone have qu any questions, issues about navigating the tools I just went over? Sweet, okay. Um, so yeah, we'll get into typography. So typography and design, this is one of my favorite topics to discuss just because it's typography is in everything you see and use. Um, it's done very well sometimes and done very badly sometimes. It contributes to the ease of accessibility and the digestion of text. Um, it gives personality to different websites brands, I'll show you guys some of like recent examples I've seen that are great use of typography. And it also expresses emotion through its characteristics. Um, 
right here we have an example on medium which is uh takes on like a minimalist approach when it comes to typography it's very simple easy to navigate in terms of color and text you have a sans serif bolded title and you have um serif text so it's just very straightforward very easy to navigate and it's just so easy to read tons of different articles on tons of different topics um, this is an example of just how type could be used in different situations. Um, this is not my favorite example, honestly, <laughs> but um, all, you could see um, on the red here, you have the numbers in a ser serif fonts and then um, little subheadings in the sans serif fonts. So we'll also get into how you could balance the balance different kinds of fonts and have them work together instead of against each other. And then distinguishing between a typeface versus a font. So to put it in simple terms, a typeface is kind of like the umbrella term for a bunch of fonts. So a typeface is like the general term. So for example, Times New Roman is a typeface right here. But if you're specifically distinguishing, distinguishing types of Times New Roman, for example, oh, like 12 point Times New Roman bolded or 12 point Ro Times New Roman in italics, then you're distinguishing a specific um, font that's under this umbrella term of what a typeface is. Um, yeah, hopefully I explained that pretty clearly. Um, serif versus sans serif fonts, the two like biggest families of fonts you'll see. Um, simply serifs, so you could see how there's a, it distinguishes a lot. Uh, there's more curves happening and it's a little fancier, oldish and has a timeless approach to it versus sans serif, um, just very more geometric and gives off a more modern aesthetic um, as we'll see in the next examples. And um, the most basic example as a, of a serif font as I, as I just showed you is Times New Roman. And then for example, Futura and Helvetica right here are like some of the most popular sans serif fonts. Um, here's some simple examples. So on the left-hand side here, you have your serif fonts, and then on the right, you have your sans serif fonts. Obviously, you have Berkeley and Time. Berkeley is like an academic institution. Um, it's been here forever. They keep a they keep the aesthetic with the serif font, but you could see it says University of California under in all caps in a sans serif font. So that's a good way to, you know, delineate a slight hierarchy right there. Um, you have time. Again, been around forever, very reliable. Um, and the typeface provides that type of aesthetic. And then you have Tiffany and Co, um, who wants to also establish like cred credibility with how timeless their um, company and their products are. And obviously on the right, you have companies and brands that are always trying to innovate. So you have LinkedIn, you have Microsoft. These are like modern things that are used by people that are always being reiterated. These are things that are constant new features and products are coming out. And um, St. Laurent, if you look at like any, like if you just pull up a list of a bunch of high fashion brands, I feel like most of them will have the most basic um, sans serif font in black. It's just, they all look almost exactly the same. Like Balenciaga, for example, you, probably difficult to de delineate those. And then for um, typography being used in magazines, you could see Vogue uses like a very stylized, um, serif font right here again like establishing how long they've been in the industry uh, but also you can see them contrasting with sans serif fonts over here for the headlines and then on con in contrast you see this architecture magazine and they basically almost exclusively use um, sans serif fonts and it makes sense if it's called modern country that there's just use of sans serifs everywhere And then examples of type on um, user interfaces, you could see in the middle, you have uh, New York Times and they have headlines in a serif font, your Tuesday briefing, while other apps, for example, Airbnb right here and Uber Eats, everything is in a sans serif font. Um, and Ace brought this up like in the last lecture, I, um, the last lecture I taught last year, but if you go on almost like any app on your phone, it'll, I feel like it'll almost exclusively be in a sans serif font. Um, you could think of Uber, you could think of Lyft. I don't know. It's just when it comes to using modern apps, sans serif fonts are usually the go-to instead of a serif font. But when it comes to like news uh, outlets and stuff, they 
tend to switch it up a little bit and they'll use both at the same time. Um, discussing the hierarchy of fonts. So this is helping with visual hierarchy and bringing users' attention to what you want them to see first and then what you, what you want them to see afterwards. Um, it's creating visual interest and it's establishing information hierarchy. So um, for example, right here, the headline is the first thing you probably want the user or the viewer to see. So you have this as the biggest font and you have it bolded and you follow that with a sub headline that's not bolded and a lot smaller. So um, the way you compose fonts and organize them is gonna inform how someone's gonna view what you're looking at. Um, it wouldn't make sense, for example, to put the body copy in bold because if everything's bolded, it might be a little too harsh on the eyes and not as smooth of a reading experience. Um, mixing and matching fonts, for example. So generally speaking, uh, simple is better. I made this mistake when I first started out designing, I would kind of try to be a little risky and combine tons of different wacko crazy fonts. Uh, but generally, which is okay if you know when you're breaking the rules appropriately, but if you're trying to make something for a user and you're trying to make something effective, um, simple is always better. So a contrast of fonts is well advised to establish hierarchy, pairing titles in sans serif and the body, the body text in serif helps distinguish and categorize information. So it might be a little difficult to see, but you could see here in both of these examples, the titles are in a sans serif and the body text is in a serif font. Um, which is a really popular option. It's very easy on the eyes and it just looks good. I think a lot of repeated exposure to a lot of um, a lot of this kind of text hierarchy being used, it just makes it a normal thing to rely on. Um, grouping fonts by similarity works as well. Um, so these are different examples where, you know, the New York Times um, paired sans serif fonts with serif fonts again, you could see the body text here is a serif font. Um, the title is a serif font and the sub headline is a sans serif font. So it's kind of, you just kind of play around. There's no right answer in terms of, oh, should I make my headline this and my body text this? Um, as well as I feel like if you look at it and it feels pretty intuitive and you could rely on other outlets that also use reliable examples like this, you will be able to balance that similarity and difference. The weight of fonts, I went over this briefly before. Um, it is super useful to pick a font that has a lot of weights. Um, this much I feel like you don't need. I feel like if you have a bolded font, an italic, and then like a light, that should work for you fine, and a regular, of course. Um, but you could see generally ultralight is not the best thing to use in terms of um, readability. And bold is great for headlines, and regular is great for body text, like I said before. Um, and type and identity. So this is an example of how text can inform a company and our organization's um, brand identity. So in this example, the combination of large size serif and sans serif fonts suggests originality and innovation while maintaining a minimalist personality. And you can see in the brand name that the N and the E are in sans serif and then these are in serif fonts. So when it comes to like creating logos, for example, you could get a little more creative with how you want to approach that as long as you feel like it's informing um, what you're making. Um, and it reminds me of Glossier, I think is the brand. Um, they have a very minimalist approach. I think I think the logo is a sans serif font. It's like a slanted slant sans serif font and their packaging is pretty minimal from what I remember. So that's another example of how, you know, your text choice is kind of informing how your audience is going to perceive your products based on exactly how you're designing and presenting your products. Uh, this is a comparison. You have this chaotic mix of really colorful, bolded, underlined, crazy things happening. Uh, I honestly don't remember if this is a real website or not. It might, but you could obviously see that you know, this is very difficult to navigate. Everything is fighting for your attention here. And I don't know how the hell you would be able to find what you're looking for here. Uh, external tools, typography, let's see. Oh yeah, so these are a couple of resources when it comes to finding typefaces and fonts. I know that when I originally started, it was pretty difficult to 
know exactly where to find fonts and especially how to pick them. There's thousands and thousands of fonts you could pick from. Um, so these are a couple of resources that I found really helpful during my journey. Um, TypeWolf, it's a typography blog website. And this is really helpful because it also acts as a resource that not only provides you with fonts, but directs you to what is currently trending in the industry. Other, it directs you to resources to other free fonts. Like these are the best sans serif fonts to use. These are the best serif fonts to use. Um, so there's tons of other type guides and resources that are included in this that just makes it uh, really helpful to use. And it's very easy to navigate as well. And then two more examples, Adobe fonts and my fonts. Um, honestly, my fonts, it is the biggest collection of fonts on the web, but it's not my personal favorite because they charge for their fonts. Um, no one wants to pay for a font. Uh, but Adobe fonts, they have a huge uh, selection of fonts and font packs, and that's easily accessible. Obviously, if you're a student here, you're going to get that for free. Every font is for free. Um, when I make designs and such, this is actually the first resource I always go to because Adobe fonts, it's not the most expansive, but they usually have all the essential fonts of what you need or and slash looking for. And does anyone have any questions so far? Of water. Oh, okay. Um, I've been talking for a while, so I'll give us a quick three to four minute break um, to use the restroom or just chill, and then we'll pop right back into color and color theory, color styles. And let's come back at 6.07. Okay, sweet. So we're going to hop back into lecture and I'll talk about color now and color theory and styles, like I said before. So color and design, of course, colors are used to attract attention, similar to typography. And it also evokes emotions, different meanings, uh, ties into brand identity and aesthetic and also contributes to the usability of a product, like um, as we'll see soon. And the wide variety of color use and application is apparent in everything you interact with, um, no matter what you see, and it pairs very well with type as well, so. Okay, gosh. Um, so for example, red is a, an emotionally intense color. Uh, it co compels passion and action, pushes us to watch that next ep Netflix episode or pay attention to signs on the road. So as examples here, you have um, Netflix, iconic red logo, um, using red as a call to action, um, um, watching that next episode or suggesting you new things to watch. You have Tinder, um, ties into their icon of a flame, um, like igniting love or passion or whatever. Um, you have a stop sign, of course, and then CNN um, ties into breaking news and also compels you to keep scrolling and looking at what they present. Um, so this is probably one of the strongest colors you could use in a design. And it's especially um, not always a call to action, but also, of course, like to stop doing something or it's something alarming or telling you that something is very important to look at. Um, in contrast, we have blue, um, more of a neutral color. It's a reliable and calming color. Um, it establishes trust and reliability with users, especially for companies that handle your money and information. Um, for example, you have Facebook. I don't know how reliable that is, but for example, Chase as a bank, they use blue, um, they handle your money and uh, you have messages in blue when you use iMessage versus green Android. I feel like blue is a much prettier color to look at when you're um, typing. And then, um, yeah, so these are a couple, a couple examples of how blue is establishes a more neutral tone, um, more trust uh, and more calming. You have green. I feel like this is also an adjacent color to blue in terms of um, being a little more neutral. It's peaceful. It's healing. Um, it's associated sometimes with the environment and nature. Um, and if you could see this, Starbucks and Spotify are probably two of the biggest uh, companies slash corporations that use green in their logo. And you have examples of how green could be used when it terms when it comes to um, uh, the environment and such. Yeah. 
That's a great question. I, I, this is when it comes to when, uh, so this is when companies could like break different design rules and such, because I feel like since Spotify started off with a green logo, um, I feel like in my opinion, it almost establishes trust. And since their only main competitor is Apple music really as like the two powerhouses of streaming um, and Spotify was first. So to me, when I see green on Spotify, it's just, um, there's a level of trust because of how often I use it and trust like it to keep my playlists and all the albums and music releases. Um, but I also feel like just because it started off originally green, I can't see it as any other color anymore. Like if they change to red or blue, it would be such a strong change. It'd just be like jarring in a way. Um, but yeah, but that's when it really comes to personal preference. Um, like Starbucks, I'm, I can't think of exactly why it'd be green. I don't know if they have like reusable, they're pushing for like reusable straws and cups and stuff, but I don't know. I don't think of green when it comes to coffee, but also, I mean, they started off green as well. So um, it's also just like repeated exposure to something. Sometimes I feel like a company or an organization almost owns a color at that point when they're, you know, been associated with that color for so long. And I'll, we'll show more examples um, during the lecture too. Yeah. Um, another strong color, um, similar to red is yellow. I, uh, this is a very vibrant and creative color. It's coming off like lime greenish in the projector, but um, um, usually also competes for your attention, um, compels feelings of happiness. For example, you have Ikea. This is blending um, yellow and blue as a more neutral color. Um, you have this brain flyer on the right that's compelling a lot of like energy and creative juices that are flowing. And then you also have yellow paired with red here where like red is stop, but then yellow is like caution slash warning. Um, and then the iconic yellow sticky notepads. And then black, uh, this is a more formal and sophisticated color. Um, it tells the audience, yes, I am professional and appropriate, trust me. There's a level of intrigue and elegance that makes black a reliable and colorful power to abide by. Um, these are very few examples. Um, Uber obviously uses black um, and almost acts like as a, as a business transaction. I think Erin helped teach this lecture last year and she brought up how Uber is in such stark contrast with Lyft, like as direct competitors, like Lyft is this bright, vibrant, like pink purplish color while Uber like sticks true to this like very modern, sophisticated look when it comes to like ride transportation. Um, so that's very interesting for sure. And then obviously you have like huge powerhouses such as Apple, huge fashion companies like Chanel um, that use black and white just as like a classic look. But obviously the thing about these powerhouses is that they don't really stick to black as their main logo. Obviously Apple has tons of different colorful products and that their logo will change with that as well. So there's also, I feel like a lot of variability depending on the organization or company. If their main logo is black, you could also switch around as well. Like it wouldn't be strange if seen like a red Apple logo for like a red pair of AirPod Maxes, for example, or something. And then on the right, bottom right, you have a formal business card. Feels more sophisticated, more formal. You seem more professional versus if I did like, I don't know, like a moss green or something. I don't know. I guess it depends on exactly what you're selling. So. And then this is just a general breakdown of maybe what different colors could present in terms of emotion and um, no. Oh, does the pink and purple look exactly the same? <laughs> oh my god. Okay, that's really weird. The pink and purple are like very different on my computer. I don't know why. Oh, and red and brown. Okay, sorry, that's not supposed to show up like that. But um, generally these are kind of basic guidelines. They're not always supposed to be, you know, followed. Um, but yeah, wow, that is. Sorry about that. That's not a great example. Um, so moving on to how color is used on the internet. Um, the thing about color is sometimes you won't pay much attention to a website that uses color really well, but you'll really notice it when a website uses it really badly. So for example, Yelp is great at using color because they have white as like a neutral background color, but then you have important information like the title of these restaurants bolded, as well as the stars in red. As you can see, like they're using red as a call to action here. You're searching for um, a restaurant, you have a location in red and then you have, you know, the stars in red to see if you actually want to go there or not, if the food is good. Um, so there's a clear balance there. It's easy to find that information versus um, 
this Oktoberfest website that has a lot going on. You have reds, you have yellows, you have this brick background that's blending into this banner right here. You have blues here, you have underlined links. It's just, it's madness. So um, clearly you could, um, there's a lot of thought that goes into websites that attract a lot of users in terms of how they approach type and color into their interfaces and design. And then running through components of a color, you have um, four, three components that make up a color, which are hue, value, and saturation. Hue is what a color is, like blue versus red. You have value, which is how bright a color is. You could see this is really dark. Oh, what? No. Okay. <laughs> On my computer, there, there are different levels of um, brightness. Sorry about that. Saturation, this is accurate though, um, how intense a color is. So this almost becomes like a light pink and this is like a true red color. And then this is an easy way to see, distinguish between these types. Uh, saturation is on a horizontal axis. Your value is on a vertical axis. And then you could manually change your hue through here. Just show you a quick example. Make a rectangle here. And then if I go to this color, I could change the saturation of my red like this, um, the value, and then the hue entirely if I want this to be a green, for example. And then the color picker. What is the color picker? Um, this allows you to apply color to fill, stroke, and vector objects. Um, and it could be used to apply fills and gradients um, and control hue, saturation, and opacity. And it could be found on here, I'll show you. So for example, pretend I have this rectangle, which is gray, and I wanna make it green. I click on this. If I click on the fill here, you could see this little guy right here. Once I click on this, it's activated, and I click on the vector or object I want the color to turn to. So this, and then boom, you have two green squares. And then this is a basic rundown of the the color, uh, I guess, menu, you could call it. Uh, one, if you click on solid, it gives you different options for gradients. If you click on two, you have different blending modes here. Um, I think this is the exact number and quantity of blending modes that are also in Photoshop and Illustrator. I'll show a quick example of that after. We went over three, which is like the value, hue, saturation. Um, six right here. Oh, four is the color picker. Six is... Um, I think it deals with the identity of different colors. So obviously if you click hex, you have specific hex codes. But for example, if you're using color for coding, then you would click CSS. Um, and yeah, to show you a quick example of blending modes, pretend I want this square to be blue. If I overlap these, they're solid colors, no effects are applied. So um, it looks pretty normal. But the minute I click this little raindrop and I press darken, then you could see this um, um, me playing with the actual opacity in different blending modes. So you have color burn. Um, to this day, I sometimes still don't know like which one to use. This is about like experimentation in my example. I feel like the more you use these, the more you know when exactly to use them and when not to. Um, so yeah. And then external tools for color, uh, more resources, similar to what I went over for typography. Um, coolers, uh, this is a pretty popular one. A lot of people know it. It's a popular website to explore, use, and generate color palettes. You could generate like an infinite number of color palettes. Um, when I'm struggling with like design inspiration, I would hop on colors and I might select like a color that I love that I want to use and I'll lock that color. And then you could keep generating like a million color palettes that goes well with the color you chose. So um, if you're struggling with color choices and you just can't find the right mix, this is a great resource for inspiration and also just taking directly from what the website has. And then Dribble is another website. Um, it doesn't exactly have to do with color like um, coolers, but it's a platform for creatives to share their work. And you could also find a lot of color inspiration um, I mean, this also goes for type inspiration as well. So it's a great resources for a great resource for finding inspiration on all this stuff. And obviously, you could type color palette directly into it and find the resources you need. 
Does anyone have a lot of any questions? I've been talking a lot, so. <laughs> Sweet, okay. Um, styles, color styles. So this is especially important. Um, color styles are important if, for example, if you're engaging in a project and you're gonna keep repeating a certain color palette, you don't wanna keep copying over certain colors. You wanna create a resource where you could consistently keep applying these colors. So this is what styles allows you to do. Um, you define a set of properties for an object and you could keep reusing the same colors. And this could also be done for paints, text, and effects. Um, and I'll show you an example of how to create a color. Oh, skipping a lot here. Um, so let me just show you. So I'll use these squares again. Pretend these are two colors I want to use in a style. I'll click on this and I'll click these four little things right here and I will press the add button. And I could name this um, green, green. So now you have green, green in your styles and it will pop up right here. And you could constantly refer to this when you're creating other, de other designs. So you don't have to keep copying or uh, eye dropping slash color picking the specific color you keep wanting to use. Um, obviously I have a couple other ones. I don't know why this is called demo blue cause it's red, but um, yeah. And then um, textiles, it's the exact same thing um, as a color style, just with text. And you would do the exact same thing um, when making a color style. You would click those four dots and then it would save, um, you could save like different types of um, bolded fonts, italics, body text, and you could rename those as well. So for example, if you're creating an app and you're making a user interface, you could use, you could constantly keep using the same types of fonts um, when you're making, you know, headlines and different things that call different um, levels of attention. And then we'll move into the last part of the lecture, which is critique and going over why critique is so important. I believe you'll be doing this in your lab um, for your next lab with your TA. So this is a brief introduction to how critique works. Um, so common misconceptions for critique, I feel like people might think you're being too mean, you're being too harsh, it's undermining someone's capabilities when it comes to design, et cetera. Um, but in reality, uh, critique is the best thing you could provide for someone and also the best thing that someone could provide for you. It's a super beneficial process and, and you could use the commenting tool as well. So we're calling back the tools that we mentioned earlier. Um, so, I mean, I knew when I was first starting out, it could be a little scary giving critique because you don't want to be too mean and also getting critique because you don't want to get your feelings hurt. But um, if you approach it in the appropriate way, um, it could help immensely with what you're working on. Oh, keep skipping. Okay. Um, so the main critique method we'll be referring to is the sandwich method. Um, the constructive is supposed to be yellow, by the way. Um, but basically how this works, it's a three-step process. You provide positive feedback, construct, uh, follow up with constructive uh, criticism, and then close with positive feedback. And negative or constructive feedback should not be rude, but it should be beneficial and improvement oriented. And we'll see that in this example right here. Um, this is a bad example of how to use the sandwich method. So pretend um, my friend made this logo called cool creations and the feedback i give him is i think this logo looks pretty good but i'm not a fan of the colors you chose overall it's really creative and the ice cream cone is cool the reason why this is bad is because it's pretty broad and not specific and there's no real call to action for what my friend should do with this feedback i didn't really give any outlets of um how specific things should be improved or exactly why um, I'm pointing out the things I chose other than I'm not a huge fan of the colors, but that could be a very subjective thing as well. A good slash better example of the sandwich is more detail oriented. Uh, you could say, this is great. I love the contrast between the colors and the, uh, and the beige, the colors really pop. What made you choose them? And then follow up with constructive. I recommend staying consistent with the typefaces. The sans serif C's look a bit awkward with, when the remaining letters are serif and then close with, but overall, I think the design matches the playfulness of the brand, the little details and the drops are a nice touch. So here you could see that I'm being a lot more detailed in how I'm allowing my friend to actually fix the logo in a way that makes sense, in a way that um, 
doesn't hurt his feelings, but is actually making it feel like I have actual useful feedback to provide. So how do these two examples differ? I went over this already, but bad feedback is vague. Uh, you don't want to be unspecific. You don't want to say, I'm not a huge fan of this. Um, any broad statements like that won't be very helpful when you're giving feedback or critique. Um, and also critiquing someone's work personally by using you is unprofessional. Like, why, like, I don't like the way you did blah, blah, blah. You should not call someone out directly like that. Um, and good feedback is specific. It's detailed. It's constructive, like I showed um, previously. And then we're going to end with a demo. Okay, we're doing like really good on time. So um, uh, if you guys want to follow along, I will, we'll be recreating this um, screen grab of uh, a task like app. And I'll go over here to the demo space. So if you want to, um, if you're on the slide deck, just navigate to the pages over here and go directly below to demo space. And we'll be creating this. Um, from scratch, I'll be stealing a couple of these assets to save time, but um, yeah, feel free to follow along. You could watch. I recommend doing it along uh, with me just so you can get a feel of um, how to actually use the tools we've been practicing. Um, so yeah, and then let me know if you guys have any questions, if I'm going too fast or anything like that. Um, so to start, I'll press F right here and I'm going to create a frame. Um, could do anything here. I'm not sure what this is, but we could, let's just do the iPhone 14 pro and it's okay that it's not the exact same dimensions. We could, um, reorganize when needed. And, uh, we'll start by making this little hamburger icon, um, the three bars right here. So not going to steal directly from that, but what I'll do is I'll press R. Um, these are actually rectangles that have rounded corners. So I'll go over to my frame here and I'll create one rectangle here. And then I'll hold option and I'll copy these like this. And then these guiding lines should give you a, when you're copying over, it'll show you how many um, you have. So look similar enough, we'll improve that a little better. Um, actually, let me make sure these are exact. So. <laughs> So if I double click this, you could I could see that I'm not gonna do it specifically, but I'll change the measurements manually to 43 by four. So go over here and on the top right hand here, I'll do 43. Oh wait, nope, that's the orientation. 43 by four. Okay, that looks a little more accurate. And then I'll copy these down. I'll do width five. And then to copy the color, I could drag and highlight all of these and then use the eyedropper tool. So I'll click fill, eyedropper, and then relocate over here and copy this exact shape. Boom. And then boom. And then I'll just group these together. So I'll highlight all of these, command G. Oh, wait. Sorry, before I do that, <laughs> rounding the corners. I forgot about this, <laughs> my bad. So um, right here, you could round the corners. We'll set this to like maybe four or five. So five, you could see now has rounded corners. I'll just do that for all of them, even though this is more work than I needed to do. And now all the corners are rounded. Now I'll group them so that I can move them around and not have to keep highlighting them and dragging them. You could just highlight these. And then here, I'll just show this and then group the selection. So we have that in place. I'll move that to like right here. Um, and yeah, that's how you make the hamburger menu. And then you, I'll rename this to hamburger icon. So now that that's made, we are not recreating the Figma logo. That's gonna take too long. So I'll just steal directly from this and copy it directly, in, oh, directly into this. And the guiding line should allow me to place this in the middle. That uh, looks good. And then um, let's do the text. This bolded good morning miles. I'll do good morning Caden instead. So the, th uh, the cool thing is it should work. If I click on the specific style, it should save the options that um, I wanna work with. So since I clicked on good morning miles, when I type, it should save these exact same settings. This. 
And then I could place this in the middle of this. So this long format is interesting. I'll distribute a little better. I think Ace is a lot better at being like very precise of how to handle like margins and such. I'm kind of eyeballing it. So um, yeah. And then let's create the daily tasks. I'll click on this so I could use that font. And then type in daily tasks. And I'll place that uh, in line with the hamburger icon right here. So those guiding lines, that looks like it should work. Um, is everyone okay so far? Am I going too fast or good? Sweet, okay. Um, so let's make these buttons or the chore icons. So um, this right here, again, is similar to the hamburger menu. It's a rectangle. So I'm gonna do command R and I'll make this rectangle. And then to copy the same dimensions, I'll go over here and let's see, this is 365 by 60. So I'll type the exact same thing here. So width 365 and then height 60. And okay, wait, I forgot. These are different phone screen sizes. I'm gonna make this smaller. That should work. Right. Yeah, that looks good. Yeah. And then I'm going to round these corners. These are rounded to 11. I'll round these to 11 as well. Boom. So you have your rounded button. Um, and then again, eyedropper tool, change this color. Like that. And then we could copy this text. So select that text and then that should enable me to use the exact same type, take out the trash. And then when it comes to aligning this text with the button so that it's exactly in the middle and everything's aligned perfectly, you could hold shift to select uh, multiple objects. So I'll hold shift, click the text here and then click the button here. And then you could see up here on the design tab, I'm gonna align it in the middle here and then align this centered right there, boom. So that looks pretty accurate. Um, and then let me select both of these and I'll copy these down like this. Stick to 31, 31. And then I will change obviously these colors to gray and then the text to black. So I'll click this, uh, shortcut I for eyedropper, boom. Click again, click I make this gray, and then I'll have both these texts become black, like that. Okay, these are spaced out a lot. I'm gonna move this up a little bit. And then if you don't wanna keep like highlighting both and taking them out, I recommend you group these as well. So group, I'll group this selection, and I'll group this selection. So now they act as um, composite objects. And then lastly, we'll create the call to action, which is the add new task button. I'm gonna copy this again. And this is a cool shortcut. I'm gonna ungroup this for now, just so I could show you this example. But um, this is a shortcut that's borrowed from Illustrator. If you wanna switch out the fill and make it the stroke in instead, I'll click this. And if you press shift X, you could see that I switched the fill to the stroke right here. So to do that again, if I want to turn this back into a fill, I'll press shift X and it turns back to gray. It's a little hard to see. This projector is like not dealing with color well, but you can see that happen. And then I'll make this add new task and then make this the same gray color. Like that. Um, and then to save time as well, I'm not gonna make this little red plus button. I'm gonna copy this over, but you would make this the exact same way you would make this hamburger menu. It's made out of re rounded rectangles and you could use the design bar to personally align in the middle and the center. So let's just copy this, paste it here. Oh, no. And then I'll position this right in the middle here. 
And yeah, and then I'll group these so they act as one object. And I think that's finished. I don't think I'm missing anything. Um, does anyone have any questions about anything I did there? If I went too fast or anything? Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. So, uh, um, are you talking about like when I was able to like copy these over really fast based on this? Yeah. Or, yeah. So I would just let me let me see if this answers. Um. So let me see. Yeah. Like the, I mean, you could do that, but what I did was, um, when I click, if you click on a specific font you want to copy, I, uh, Figma will save those settings. And once you start typing, it'll do those same set. Yeah. It'll automatically. So let me see, for example, let me see, it's already doing this, but if I, yeah, you just click on it. So, but if I wanted to, yeah, if I wanted to do take out the trash, I just clicked on take out the trash. And then once you type, it'll change to that style. Yep. Yeah, of course. Um, and let me see, is that it? Yeah. So, um, Ace, do you want to take over, <laughs> wrap up? Okay. <laughs> Thank you guys. <laughs> All right, hello. I just showed up here to do a little bit of a wrap up. Um, we have some more logistical stuff to share with you all today. Um, yeah, so based on today's uh, lecture, we're gonna be doing a homework based on brand design systems. So we talked a lot about, or we, I, I wasn't here. Caden talked a lot about textiles, color styles, typography, that kind of thing. Uh, and the one way to practice that is by examining existing brands. So your homework this week is to examine a brand that you personally like, find something that you think is really interesting, uh, has really cool visual design choices, a really interesting um, identity, and basically de deconstruct it, identify the font, identify the colors that they use, um, and put them in this file that we set up for you um, in the homework. The lab that you're going to have this week is actually critique. So we talked about critique. I don't know if you already mentioned that it's going to be crit, um, but the idea here is critique is a difficult part of the design process. It's hard to put your work in front of other people, the lab teams that you're in for the semester, you're going to be working with for the entirety of this entire semester. And so getting comfortable showing your work in front of these students who are in the exact same position as you, they're trying to learn with you, um, is one way to practice uh, doing these critique skills. So be ready to do this in lab this week. You should already have the trading card completed. If you haven't completed it already, try to get it done before lab or just bring whatever you have. Um, and please try to make it. If you absolutely can't make it to lab this week, please tell your TA ahead of time. This goes for any week, but it's especially important this week because if we have low numbers at one lab, um, it's going to change the experience for everybody else. Um, also, whoa, why is it pink? Whoa. Oh my gosh. I cannot advance the slide. Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, so another important thing is that we've just added B courses. So thank you all for bearing with us this past week. I know we had the weird submission form for the homework this time. If you had any issues submitting it, uh, just get in by the end of the day. It's not a huge deal. Um, but B courses is now live. So future assignments are all going to be there. Um, is anybody not on the B courses? Yay. Okay, great. Um, everyone's gotten on it. That's great. Um, just go ahead and check there. All of the links to the stuff like the homework is going to be there. One other thing is that this past week's homework file um, is going to look a little bit different than it does in the future. Um, we're going to be using community like we'd mentioned before. So it's going to link you to the community file. In the top right corner, there'll be a blue button that says get a copy. And that'll, it's, going to, it's going to do the duplication process for you. So you don't have to um, worry about the editing um, permissions that you originally had. Um, the readings are also going to be listed on B courses. I know that some people had some issues um, accessing them this week. Um, that should be it. The last thing is lab makeups. So if you cannot make it to your lab, again, notify your uh, TA. But you can also always come make up labs with me and office hours on Mondays at noon. This is the easiest way to make up lab. If you can't make it to that time either, just contact your uh, lab TA and set up a time to uh, make it up with them as well. But yeah, that should be it. Um, any other questions logistically or anything else? Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. Please do. Please shift the call. Just take like a second. But um, 
I I love um this is a great example. New jeans is um <laughs> their their design team like is really well at using type because they're able to blend sans serif and serif fonts really well together. I think so. Where is their name? I this is like I think the most common logo, and you can see they're blending like stretched um sans serif fonts with these like weird wacko letters right here. But they also have instances where they use like strictly um serif fonts like this, but they're playful with it. Like you're playing around with the organization of these different letters. Um, and it ties really well into like their brand statement of like why they call themselves new jeans and like a pair of jeans is like kind of timeless and you can keep wearing them over and over again. And the design of how they approach like typography, I think really expresses that well. And it's like one of the few instances where like artists or groups are able to very clearly like establish an identity with the type options they chose that are like very fitting for the times and for who they are. Um, and yeah, sorry, that, that was it. I just thought that was like super cool. So, um, but that should be everything, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so uh, thanks so much for coming out and we're finished. Yeah. Oh, secret word. Okay, it'll be new jeans. Yeah. One word. Okay. Sweet. Thank you guys for coming.